Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. You're either all in or you're not going to be a part of it. That was the work ethic. And we've got some funny stories that kind of deal with that too. You know, uh, as much as I love Terry, uh, the, the actual truth is, is uh, very first day that, that they walk into the studio, Terry is basically like, I don't need these two guys. Mm-hmm. I don't need Sterling. I don't need Tim. We're going to, you know, we're going to be here for a while. Um, and, you know, my, my version of the story is, is that, and Sterling, correct me if I'm wrong on this. It was the guys in the band that just basically kind of went, uh, no, these are our guys, and uh, hmm. we want them here. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And you know, not, not, not that Terry was trying to uh, not include us. It was he's used to working by himself without an hmm. assistant or a second engineer, and and that was his. That was the way he rolled, and uh, he was being protective of hmm. what that bubble was. You know, uh, yeah. I think, and and so not to. Not to belittle anything about Terry because that dude is an absolute gem yeah. of a person, anyways. But uh, no, that's that's exactly what happened. And he was like, "Well, I really don't need anybody," you know. And and but the uh, after five minutes with Dime and Vinny, they were like, "No, these guys, we need them here. They're part of the team. They're going to help you focus on what you need to focus on." And, and that's what happened, literally. That's really cool. And, you know, if, if I could add to that, and it, it, it turned <clears throat> out just so good because at some point, you know, Terry needs to leave. He needs to go back and rest hmm. for the day. That's the other thing is that a lot of people forget. These sessions, Daniel, these sessions weren't, you know, four or five hours. These sessions were days. Hmm. Sometimes uh, I don't recall uh, uh, ever a period of time that we were with Pantera that we didn't go home at some point. But these were very long days. Yeah, they were. Uh, well, they were 14, 16 hour days. 16, 16 hour days, yeah. And so I guess the point here was that it, it really kind of turned out well for everybody. Number one, it gave Sterling and I uh, uh, an opportunity, if you will, to take care of some of the um, the mechanical, technical business, if you will, mm. uh, that Terry very easily could do and I'm sure uh, would have handled mm. that extremely well. Mm. But uh, it's like to um, to add to that, it showed that he had confidence in us, guys. I'm going back to the hotel. Got to get some rest. We're going to be back tomorrow. Here's what I need for hmm. to happen tonight before you leave the studio. Before you know, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning uh, arrives. Here's the uh, the task for the day. Hmm. Mm-hmm. So would it be so, fair to say uh, if I could just jump in? So would it be fair to say I guess your relationship with Terry. You being both of you guys, I guess it, it developed over the course of the time you were working with him? Yes. Almost immediately. Hmm. Yes. Because it took it took that, what t- Tim was just talking about, it took that stuff off of Terry's plate so Terry could concentrate on the art of mixing. Hmm. You know, and, and the actual task, the artistic task of what needed to happen there, his role as producer, keeping that train on the tracks. Me and Tim are handling the mundane things like, you know, make sure the tape machine's calibrated you know if we need to edit make sure we got what we need but this is pre-pro tools you know it's it's when pro tools was just starting to appear on the scene so it's all analog 24 track two inch tape and and outboard gear no plugins you know this was a a real studio with real analog gear that breaks and has to be maintained and and so you know we you know get on the phone and call this guy because i need this piece of gear here tomorrow you know, those kinds of things. Call Nashville, call Dream Hire in Nashville, you know, and have this on, put on a truck. Things like that. You know, it's it's not it, it's not as simple as as it is today. You're talking what, twenty five years ago. Yeah. You know? To to kind of chime in, I don't know that I would ever want to go back to, you know, the days of twenty four track, two inch tape and hurdles, uh, things to get past with all of that. I don't know that I would ever want to go back to that. But at the same time, okay. I think that there is, we're, we're still exploring uncharted territory when it comes to isolation. Mm-hmm. 
whether it's the engineer and the uh, you know and the band or the band members hey you know just send me the song i'll put the vocals on at my place and i'll send it back and you know and and then no one's really rubbing elbows with one another it yeah. loses i think that that's been a very big step backwards for music in general hmm. that's just my opinion yeah i i echo that to tim because yeah. wow yeah yeah in my it's view a, i think that uh I think the technology has opened so many, I think it's a net positive to technology, but the one big drawback is that now you don't need to spend years and years learning how to really master your vocals or to play a guitar or whatever it may be. You can just kind of do it programmed, which is great, but it also, it completely kills the necessity to have a band. And I think that's been really detrimental for rock and roll specifically. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's, it's a really double-edged sword. And um, I don't know, man, I, I just, I would love to see a, kick butt new band just really just blow up and get huge but i feel like the the structure of the business is not in its favor but if a band can pull it off it would be amazing so fingers crossed with that one you know i i totally hey. yes i concur with that not hey. to cut you off sterling but i i totally concur with that in the sense that i've always said this and and, and by the way you know i run my business this way i tell my students to this day i don't do anything by myself anymore it's not because I don't trust myself. It's not because I can't do it. It's because I really feel that other people's opinions and being able to have their input and to actually be able to talk about what it is that we're doing makes the difference. Uh, I know that I'm much better when I can bounce an idea off of, say, Sterling, for example. Uh, hey, Sterling, what do you think about, you know, it could be a freaking banjo part and it might be a great banjo part. But if it's too much of it and I'm not aware that it's too much, at least I can talk to him and go, what do you think about this? And he, if he's going to be honest with me, he's going to, well, that sucks because it's too much. You know, nowadays it's like, I'm going to send you a, a stereo mix. You're going to put the vocals down and you'll send us the tracks and then we'll, we'll weave it into the, we'll weave it into the song that's going to be. And I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just because I'm old school and I remember the days of, you know, having that camaraderie with mm. with with the band, being a part of, if you will, kind of the kind of the, the third wheel or the fifth wheel, whatever it might mm. be, but actually participating in the um, uh, in, in the process. And one of the things that I sincerely feel that gets lost when people start about making records and stuff like that. And absolutely nothing to take away from the bands that get to that point. But I think that um, there is a sense nowadays that gets lost in the sense that uh, the art form of recording has been, we're, we're literally on the verge of losing it. Hmm. And I, I think Sterling can probably echo this. Sterling and I have recently uh, kind of been joined back together uh, uh, in a in a uh, instructor role, if you will, hmm. and one of the big things that I see with a lot of these guys coming through school nowadays is that they're not willing to uh, they're not willing to pay the price hmm. uh, to to be able to get on the uh, you know to get on the ride and, and to be able to ride. Hmm. And the sad part about that is is that they don't even know what they're missing because they've never gotten the opportunity to experience it. I think that's what digital recording has done uh, to us all is kind of isolated a lot of us, mm. you know, that would maybe typically be in the same room together. And, you know, just speaking for myself, I miss it a lot. Just the camaraderie of being able to hang with the same people that you're recording or to be able to uh, break bread with, you know, with the with the artists that you're going to be living with for the next six, seven months or whatever. Point being is that, you know, over the over the course, literally over the course of the last couple of years for me, uh, pretty much everything that I've even remotely thought about touching has been remote. I mean, mm. it's been very isolated. Yeah, it definitely makes developing relationships with artists a lot different than before. Speaking of which, how did your relationship with Pantera begin, Sterling? Did it have a connection with Tim in any way? Yeah, pretty much uh, the same as Tim's. We were both there at the same studio at the same time when they came in to finish Far Beyond Driven in 90, October of 93 at the Sound Lab, Dallas Sound Lab. 
I think it's fair to say, Daniel, you know, that uh, Sterling and I both, we were, we were big fans from the get-go before we had ever met uh, the Abbott brothers. I had met, and I think I had mentioned this in an earlier uh, discussion with you, that I had actually met their dad way before I ever met the, uh, mm. met the Abbott brothers. So Sterling and I both kind of knew what was coming once we kind of got word hey, uh, you know, the guys from Pantera are coming in and uh, uh, we want to put you guys on there. I was honored to even be considered, you know, worthy to to be on a project that big. Same. That's awesome. Same. I knew it was going to be huge. I was a fan since high school when I lived way out in uh, uh, San Angelo, Texas, where I was raised. And so I, I had already been listening to them for years from their independent releases. Oh, back so, in the glam yeah. days, eh? Yeah, definitely. And uh, it was, uh, I didn't ever think in my wildest dreams I'd ever even meet them, much less work with them and, and live with them. So, you know, it was a very, uh, very exciting time for both of us to get to be part of that. That's so cool. And not to mention Terry Day. Jeez. Yeah. Master. When it came down to the Far Beyond Driven record, and I think it's very fair to say this, and I may have even mentioned this before, mm -hmm. but Terry was the glue that held all of us together. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, he was the mother hen, if you will. Yeah. Uh, we would have, you know, we would have a pep talk by Terry. Uh, I don't know that it happened every day, but it would happen at least once a week. It's like, guys, you know. Uh, whatever y'all do, you need to be aware that every move that you make could be uh, a, it, it could be a huge detriment if you make a bad move somewhere. Hmm. And so, you know, you got to take care. Don't be idiots out there. Yep. Go have fun. But, at, uh, you know, yep. we need to be back tomorrow. So don't, yeah. you know, don't yeah. go out and do stuff that you shouldn't be doing. Yeah. <laughs> Not for sure, man. So yep. and I laugh at that because we always did stuff that we weren't supposed to be doing. <laughs> totally. Totally. Well, I was twenty three years old. That's the fun of life, man. You gotta you gotta do jeez. Well, oh, you can you know, you're called it you a teenager still. I don't know about you guys, but when I you know, when I was that age and I was told not to go do something, that was the very first thing that I went immediately to do. 100%, when did it. Hundred percent. When you get told not to do it. even if you don't want to do it, you're doing it just because you're told not to do it. You know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You take that and multiply it by about 20. When you tell Dimebag that you can't go do something, it's like, hold my beer and watch this. Uh -huh. I'm going to go do this. Uh -huh. You're going to go. <laughs> that is it's awesome. going to go. <laughs> That's so funny. So I have one more question about how the band recorded music. I know you touched on this a bit earlier, but in general, when the band would record, would they usually record off the floor together or would they typically record in isolation? when they built their own place it was just the one open live room and they would start that way they mm -hmm. would start by tracking live off the floor that's how they got that feel because they're all playing off of one one another mm -hmm. so and then and then dime would go back and and uh redo the guitars to match Vinny a little better and to match himself a little bit better but most of that that you're hearing is uh live takes like live a live foundation for sure rhythmically rex and, and benny most of the time right. were live and would phil be part of that or would he do the vocals no, i mean he would be part of the writing sessions when they would write mm -hmm. and and put start putting things together but uh like trinkill he wasn't there for at all he would mm. he did all that from new orleans but uh reinventing the steel he was there all the time 